The phrase, early YouTube is often idiosyncratic with certain video archetypes or characters that enveloped the platform. Whether it is dumb cat videos or Tourette's guy, early YouTube's place in internet culture has and will continue to be looked at fondly, and oftentimes with rose-tinted glasses. One of the most beloved and celebrated videos on this platform has been Film Cow's Charlie the Unicorn, being viewed by 36 million people just on the original video alone. That's not even counting the re-release, bringing it up to 40 million. Over the past five years, YouTube's algorithm has not favored animations, but instead longer content focused on audience retention and ad placements. This change does not facilitate bite-sized animation on the platform, seeing as animation has a more diligent and attentive creation process. While Film Cow has managed to pull an impressive amount of views for the first part of the grand finale for Charlie the Unicorn, it was not favored well in the second part. Even though subscribers are not necessarily an important part of YouTube anymore, Film Cow's audience and install base should allow him to pull away more views regardless. The focus of this video is not to ask what happened to Film Cow or even posit a downfall of video, but to focus on and analyze some of Film Cow's recent content. Compared to his early work, these new videos are eclectic and borderline experimental. There are also some of my favorite videos on this platform right now, just for the possible meta-narrative Film Cow weaves. I personally believe Film Cow is giving us a perspective on what it's like to be somebody who trailblazed and pioneered on this platform that is currently eroding its former glory. Make no mistake, the content that I'm going to show you today you're going to think is a boondoggle or that they're just some vague, abstract parody of corporate videos. While I think that might be the case, I think the formatting of some of Jason's newest videos tell us as creators how to make content on their platform. I will be quickly going through some of the recent series and more on videos to help string along the meta-narrative Jason is potentially weaving. I'm going to start off with my personal favorite as well as the driving force for this video's creation, Modern Title Series. I can only describe what the series is on a superficial level here, so I want you to experience it yourself, seeing as these are particularly short. It saves me time and you the burden of hearing my pedantic over-explanations. Welcome to Modern Titles. Today we're modernizing the title screen of Rocket Robot on Wheels for the N64. It's a fun and whimsical title screen that really gets you ready for the coming adventure. But I think we can improve it using modern techniques. I like the logo, with the cool swirl around the text. But a thinner font, like a Helvetica, would look even cooler. Everyone likes a big button, but this button could be in any game. I'd like to keep the button but introduce eye-catching branding elements. The background seems to be an amusement park of some sort, but there's a lot going on. We can simplify it without losing the excitement amusement parks bring. The most noticeable part of this title screen is the absence of a rocket. You don't want the first thing people notice to be something that's not there, but we can fix that. I think we've got what we need and can create our modern title screen. Here we go. Everything is cleaner and bolder, and we've got that rocket. By making the button the rocket, we improve brand engagement. There's also a wheel and a screw to represent the robot. Rocket, robot on wheels, you've been upgraded with a modern title screen. At first, there isn't much to unpack. There is a clear parody of corporate videos with just its presentation. All three videos are completely homogenous. The music is the same, the background stock footage is the same, and hell, if you transcribe these videos, I'm sure you can make this into the funniest Mad Libs template ever. It's clear the joke instead here is that he's taking away the character and feel by taking the skew morphism as outdated graphic design philosophy way too seriously. You can really feel the contempt from Jason with this oversimplified corporate minimalist title screens. While this may be a critique of modern games, I think this could also correlate to YouTube's abundance of bad faith criticisms and solutions towards media. Even though Jason's humor is already absurd, the series came out of the blue and the contempt is so palpable it is singeing my nose hairs. Like a Helvetica. Like a Helvetica. Even if I'm wrong here, it's the funniest and most entertaining of his recent output. Moving on from modern titles, it only gets even more absurd. I'm going to guess that these videos only took Jason about 10 or so minutes to create because they are as bare bones as these videos are going to get. Nintendo stocks are up! As of the third market closing, they're up again! Somebody find that plumber. God, I hope he's okay. What is this world without Mario? Somebody find him! 
The next four videos like this are a continuing story of sorts. This series obviously acts as a vehicle to poke fun at the profit-centered approach to dealing with the current pandemic in 2020. Without spoiling too much of the series, society crumbles and other strange occurrences happen which may be related to the boosting of Nintendo stocks. As you watch these, pay close attention to some of the word choices used by Jason. It plays into the related theme and adds an extra flavor of dystopian to the comedic brew. Going deeper into the iceberg of weirdness, video game content on this platform is often stretched to encompass almost everything. This is the logical conclusion of all video game content. Jason goes over a few controllers thoroughly and then proceeds to give them a title within the family. The conclusions Jason comes to about the controllers are obviously roundabout and overly elaborate. They're not a parent. None of our many potential parents are this cool. They're not our spouse. They're just not the marrying type. I believe they're our polyamorous partner, whose vibrant personality we love and cherish on a non-exclusive basis. This one is thrown completely at the wall, and really I can't derive much from this series. But the next and final one that I talk about is very interesting. This series is the most tangential to my argument. Here is Jason reading Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier as a bedtime story to several video games. These are the longest of his videos in his recent output as he reads through parts of the novel. The choice of literature is deliberate and meta-contextual. Rebecca is a gothic romance novel about a young woman who short-sightedly marries a wealthy widower named Maxim. However, we come to find out that the house he is residing in is haunted by the memory of his late wife Rebecca. Maxim and his housekeeper are deeply obsessed with the late wife and contemptuous feelings shift towards the narrator. Rebecca was allegedly revered by everyone, making her memory linger in everyone's heart. And here's where we're going to get into spoilers territory. In actuality, it is revealed that Rebecca was a selfish and abusive person who was obsessed with maintaining a perfect image of herself in her marriage. After a myriad of theories and investigations into her death, it is revealed that Maxim had murdered Rebecca and put her in a sinking boat, staging it as an accident, and later being declared as a suicide. What's interesting about this part is that the narrator does not think much about the murder confession. In fact, the narrator is quite naive and seems to really only take away that Maxim loves her more than Rebecca. Infer meaning from this as you will, but I think Rebecca was chosen deliberately as a way of showing Jason's love affair and conflicting feelings about this platform. The memory of Days Gone haunts and shapes how we view contemporary YouTube. Jason's use of retro games as objects in the bed lend credibility to this. They are memories of the past he is coddling and finding comfort in serving them, only to read them a damning assessment of our current situation on this platform. The sense of nostalgia pervades our current sensibilities. And with that, I think this might be Jason's most conceptual content yet, and really ties my hypothesis together. I can go on and on about these series individually and go into the little tiny videos that I'm not even going to mention. However, I think we need to bite into this medium rare steak. Get it? Film cow? 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 Cow, 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 cow. That's it. That was, that was, that was it, Steve. That was the entire bit. Nick's getting great gorilla. Guerrilla style footage for his new film for the video. As I mentioned in the intro of this video, Film Cow slash Jason has carved his legacy into the YouTube mythos with many classic animations. However, the algorithm has since disintegrated his retention and views. It's no coincidence that the thematic synergy between the series and general presentation is consistent. Whether these videos are laden with contempt through satire or just allusions to other qualms Jason might have with the website are irrelevant and debating whether or not they are personal is irrelevant as well. As it appears in this channel's catalog, it ultimately represents what is wrong with content on this site. YouTube has ultimately cultivated more and more content that is disposable, which is a thought that doesn't often occur in the audience or creator's mind. These recent videos are deliberately depraved of having any value whatsoever. Its complete lack of value is what makes them important in a meta-contextual type way. Even for the most egregious examples of brain-numbing content, this really does not give you anything other than a good laugh. Its oblique cynicism and palpable sardonics shines outside of the video player. They can fucking kill you. They can kill you, that's what they can do. I'm not even operating on the pretense that Film Cow's older and much more renowned videos are comparatively better either. Just that these specific videos, and when they released, have a much wider function. Their strangeness is meant to obfuscate your view of content as a whole. Content has become somewhat of a strange word in our internet vernacular. To illustrate my point more clearly, Jason's latest videos are intentionally not content. 
They're the sort of anti-content. This type of metatextual framing device has not been done on this platform very often. Using the platform as a pedestal is one thing, but to frame it in an abstract sense like Film Cow has without really giving much of a direct explanation is fascinating from an outside view. This direction in his content speaks to the problems with a hyperactive platform with millions of minutes of information being uploaded constantly. No one, despite the size of their audience or the mark that they leave in history, is entitled to continued success, especially considering the algorithm's involuntary ambivalence. We have seen many of the YouTubers who helped build this platform fall in relevancy or just pursue other avenues. Despite the low view count of many of these videos, it serves as a reminder of just how infinitesimal all of this is. The value of making content on this platform back then was being able to walk a new frontier in Trailblaze. This was a new space that facilitated intimate, personal, and interesting content. Today, YouTube's profit-orientated format has completely misdirected people's intentions with creating content. The old moniker of Broadcast Yourself has slowly become broadcasted for you by us. Trends are not usually lightning in a bottle. The top of a hegemon or idea usually cascades into hundreds of imitators. And it's not hard to imagine that Charlie the Unicorn or Llamas with Hats have had their imitators as well. But there is a difference between inspiration and a calculated return of investment. Most people with a cursory level of digital marketing can probably make it as an influencer and make a living in many ways. This type of content doesn't facilitate or quench our thirst for the type of content that is dominating this platform currently. I can make the argument that this is capitalism's fault, but I think it has more to do with the rapid progression and horrible dopamine diet that we subject ourselves to. It's somewhat of a shared accountability. And for Jason, this might be more apparent with his amazing success on the platform, but completely contrasted with what he's been putting out the past few months, it really illustrates much of my point. That being said, I think that the content being antithetical is exactly why it's extremely smart and in a way valuable, despite it being purposely invaluable, if that makes sense. There's an inherent value to satire, and I think Film Cow's recent output really exemplifies what you can do metatextually and even just with abstract humor to make a point, even if you have to dig a little deep to find it. Like a Helvetica. Well, hello, that was the video, and um, uh, I was supposed to put this out on my birthday, and I didn't, but, you know, that's fine. So, uh, hope everyone's doing well during this just fucking nightmare of a time. Uh, I have a new locale now. It's uh, my new recording studio, uh, which is not true. It's just my room. I just kind of staged it to look oddly like Anthony Fantano. I'm even wearing the death shirt, which is pretty funny. Um, but uh, if you can like, share, subscribe, share this video. This is one of, one of the best ones I think I've made in a long time. Um, I'm glad I was able to put out a, a video this month. Again, this is one of the best videos I think I've made in a long time. Uh, if you agree or disagree with me, tell me why in the comments. Uh, obviously, my comment section is one of the best places for discussion. And I have to thank everyone again. That uh, That's really the reason I keep coming back to making this content, even though I don't really get much views as I used to, um, just because I have such a dedicated uh, audience and fan base, I guess you can say, that keeps contributing and keeps uh, commenting and engaging in discourse around these types of subjects and I'd like to keep that uh, I like to keep that conversation going so I hope to see you guys very soon hopefully in November or maybe there might be a Halloween video or something coming out I really want to make another Halloween video uh, like I did in 2017 2018 I think it was 2017 2017 um, that was a really cool video I did maybe I'll do something similar if uh, people are watching up to this point. Uh, if you have any suggestions for a Halloween video, a la kind of the ones that I did back then, or something you'd like to see now, uh, give me a suggestion. But, um, thanks guys. See you later. Here's the end card. Do